Aratzaldeon guztioi eta ongi etori. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Buenas tardes a todos por parte del Instituto de Gobernanza Democrática Globernance, el Museo San Telmo y la Capitalidad de Cultura Donostia 2016. Eh, estamos muy emocionados a teneros esta noche con nosotros en el quinto encuentro de los diálogos europeos. Eh, nuevas tendencias de gobernanza, la politización de Europa, un homenaje a Ulrich Beck. Este ciclo que he empezado en enero y ha abordado diferentes temas de las elecciones griegas hasta los derechos humanos, el comercio, la igualdad de género y esta tarde la cuestión de la política. Eh, como el debate y el diálogo va mucho más allá que la palabra, eh, procuramos tener diferentes aspectos para promover el debate y la reflexión. Entonces, esta tarde con nosotros tenemos dos ilustradores de Make It Visual. Eh, bienvenido a Miren Castilla y Miguel Asensio. También en el blog procuramos tener diferentes reflexiones en un apartado que llamamos y e diálogos. Este mes tenemos eh, como bloguero Giuseppe Traverso Saibante, que es un abogado y coach italiano que vive entre Indonesia y Noruega. Y también para variar esta tarde tenemos unos invitados de honor del Instituto Usandizaga Peña Florida de aquí en Donosti, eh, del grado 4Q con su profesor Imanol Álvarez, que hicieron una lección de las obras de los ponentes de esta tarde, hace un par de semanas en clase, y prepararon una serie de preguntas que vamos a incorporar en, en, la, en el evento esta tarde y con vuestras preguntas también y, y reflexiones. Eh, pues vamos a empezar con el evento. Para empezar quería introducir al moderador y ponente, Daniel Inerariti. Daniel es catedrático de Filosofía Política y Social, es también investigador Iker Basque y director del Instituto de Gobernanza Democrática Globernance. Ha reflexionado extensamente sobre las transformaciones culturales y políticas de las sociedades del conocimiento, sobre la innovación de nuestros sistemas de gobierno, la democracia y la globalización. La globalización. Daniel. Rachel León, usted hoy. Hace unos meses... Eh, cuando estábamos preparando estos, estos diálogos europeos, pensamos en la jornada de hoy, que en la jornada de hoy participara Ulrich Beck. Le invitamos, aceptó venir y estaría hoy aquí si no fuera porque el 1 de enero de, de este año murió a los 70 años de edad y cuando, como me aseguraba unos meses antes, todavía le quedaban muchas cosas por hacer. Y precisamente eh, esta, esta sesión de hoy tiene una pequeña, brevísima parte de la que me voy a hacer yo cargo, que es un pequeño homenaje a Ulrich Beck. Y, y posteriormente pasaremos a, a Edgar Grande, que es el, el verdadero protagonista. Yo soy aquí simplemente el telonero. A ver cómo traducen telonero al inglés. A principios de, de los años 80, yo estaba en Alemania haciendo una estancia postdoctoral sobre el idealismo alemán y me aburría mucho estudiando a Hegel, a Schelling eh, y vi un cartel, un anuncio de clases que había eh, interesantes y había una, una asignatura que se llamaba Sociología del Riesgo, que la daba un tal Ulrich Beck. Y me apunté a aquella, a aquella asignatura y a mí eso me cambió, me cambió completamente mi vida intelectual. ¿no? Eh, en aquellos momentos acababa de producirse aquella, aquel terrible accidente de Chernobyl y la onda expansiva de, de aquel fracaso tecnológico había llegado a buena parte de Europa. Ulrich Beck de, desarrolla sus teorías precisamente en ese momento, al hilo de esa experiencia, y al hilo de, de esa experiencia desarrolla la idea de que vivimos en una sociedad del riesgo, lo cual quiere decir, entre otras cosas, que estamos a la intemperie, que los estados nacionales ya, ya no protegen o solamente nos pueden proteger transformándose profundamente, aceptando su pluralidad interior y entrando en una lógica de cooperación hacia, hacia afuera. Creo que Ulrich Beck era un cosmopolita 
porque en el fondo no se sentía absolutamente protegido en ninguna parte y al mismo tiempo eh, se consideraba, consideraba suyos todos los problemas del mundo. Recuerdo una, una anécdota que me contaba él muchos años después a propósito de esta idea de la intemperie. A principios de los años 90, el entonces líder de los socialdemócratas alemanes, Rudolf Scharping, que por cierto acabó muy mal, su vida política acabó bastante mal, eh, le visitó a, a Ulrich Beck en, en su casa junto al lago Stamberg, al, al pie de los Alpes bávaros. El tema de la conversación era precisamente la sociedad del riesgo y los cambios que la izquierda debía cometer para entender las nuevas realidades y gobernarlas. Charlaban en el jardín y Sharpin no, con, no conseguía encender un cigarro porque era incapaz de saber de dónde venía el viento y protegerse adecuadamente frente a él. ¿no? Era incapaz. Beck me, me relataba unos años después esa anécdota en el mismo sitio. Mira, de aquí venía el viento y Sharpin no conseguía encender el cigarro. Pero en el fondo se reía de cómo eh, aquella persona, eh, en aquel momento incapaz de saber de dónde venía el viento, en el fondo era una buena metáfora de la realidad, en aquel caso de la izquierda europea, pero podríamos decir de todos los agentes políticos que se sienten desconcertados en medio de una de unos cambios sociales muy, muy profundos. ¿no? Probablemente las dificultades de Sharpin para encender un cigarro, lo que ilustraba muy bien eran las dificultades generales de gobernar en el mundo contemporáneo y la, la volatilidad de las instituciones políticas, algo que no es solamente un problema práctico del liderazgo político, sino también un problema sobre todo de saber dónde, de dónde viene el viento, es decir, qué es lo que está pasando. El año pasado compartimos curso académico en, en la London School of Economics, como profesores invitados los dos, o se dio esa coincidencia, y tuve ocasión de estar varias veces con él y con Elizabeth, su mujer, otra eminente socióloga que es conocida también en, en, en esta ciudad y, y en nuestro instituto. Eh, hablamos muchas veces, recuerdo la última conversación al hilo de, de lo que podía pasar en, en Escocia, justo antes de venirme yo para aquí, y me preguntaba por Escocia, me preguntaba por las similitudes y las diferencias con, con Euskadi y le pude eh, explicar algunas cosas. Eh, era, formaba parte del Consejo Asesor Internacional de, del Instituto de Gobernanza Democrática, como el propio eh, Edgar Grande, y nos, a, nos asesoró con mucha generosidad y vino aquí eh, en, en alguna ocasión. Cuando supimos la noticia de su fallecimiento y, y pensamos qué hacer con esto que teníamos medio organizado, se nos ocurrió inmediatamente y realizar este acto con, con uno de sus más importantes discípulos, Edgar Grande, coautor con él de uno de, uno de sus libros más impactantes, por lo menos a mí me, así me lo parece, La Europa cosmopolita. Edgar Grande es, es profesor de ciencia política en la Universidad de Múnich, donde tiene la cátedra de política comparada. No voy a mencionar todos los libros que tiene, simplemente diré que eh, fundamentalmente tiene libros sobre trabajo sobre Europa y su proceso de integración. Tiene también otra serie de trabajos sobre la gobernanza en general y más en concretamente sobre la gobernanza de la ciencia en particular. Como decía, es miembro de nuestro Consejo Asesor Internacional. El tema de, de su charla es la politización de la Unión Europea. Y la cuestión que le planteábamos eh, estos días cuando preparábamos su intervención era si la la política de la austeridad o las políticas de la austeridad que hemos eh, tenido estos últimos años como consecuencia de la crisis han transformado unas decisiones que parecían lejanas y no afectar a nadie en algo que nos interesa y nos afecta. De, de alguna manera, quién sabe si, si de esta, esta experiencia de la crisis puede transformarse en una oportunidad, si podemos convertir lo negativo en positivo, si podemos convertir la afectación pasiva en implicación positiva. En definitiva, ¿cómo conseguimos politizar unos asuntos, unas decisiones, unos temas que hasta ahora han estado profundamente despolitizados? Es decir, en manos de los expertos, en lugares opacos y políticamente ininteligibles. Edgar, en vía mal. Oh. Can it, it's coming. 
Okay, thank you very much. Well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, inviting me uh, to talk to you. Uh, I will speak uh, standing um, because I, I, I think this is more convenient for me and for you. And now, uh, I suppose my, um, my slides are uh, coming. No, they're not coming. This is, still, this is still our friend Ulrich. I also have a picture. Well, here we are. Um, I will talk about uh, the politicization of Europe um, and uh, its uh, consequences and uh, possible changes. Uh, in uh, its consequences. Um, the subtitle of my presentation directly speaks to the book I wrote with Ulrich Beck 10 years ago, uh, Cosmopolitan Europe. And in this book, uh, we started from the assumption that the European project is in desperate need of being reformed and cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism uh, can be used as a source of inspiration for advancing the European project. And um, my main concern and Ulrich's main concern in, in the last years was whether the Euro crisis, the financial crisis, actually has been supporting, accelerating reforms of the European integration process or whether it has uh, further uh, disintegrated uh, Europe. Um, Okay, this is my uh, favorite picture of Ulrich. It's, um, he's not an idealist only, he's also um, an optimist, as you can see. And I can think of uh, various other descriptions. Uh, I, uh, I like this picture for several reasons. Uh, one, of, uh, one is it's the last, uh, it's, it was the last time we met in summer last year. And uh, you see it was on the occasion of a soccer match in Munich. Uh, he's wearing uh, uh, the, the fan scarf of uh, our um, uh, favorite uh, team in, uh, in, uh, in Munich. Um, if he would have read today's newspaper, he would probably not have been as optimistic uh, as uh, he is um, today. The, Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung, one of the most important German dailies, um, uh, reports on a new paper written by the French and the German government uh, in, in preparation of the next summit, the next European summit. And um, basically, uh, the two governments have decided uh, that they want to go, uh, that uh, uh, they on the one hand, don't want to support further treaty reforms, and uh, at the same time, uh, they uh, both advocate plans to weaken the European Commission and to weaken their role in the Economic and Monetary Union. Uh, so uh, the basic question, of course, is, is this good news for Europe or is it bad news? Uh, and. Um, at first sight, it seems as if uh, these plans and some others which are on the table are basically meant to leave Europe more or less as it is, to protect the status quo as we have it, not to risk major institutional changes. But the first paradox um, that, we, uh, uh, that we can find if we look at these processes in more detail is that exactly these policies that aim at protecting the status quo contribute to fundamental changes of the European project. And this is the starting point of my argument, that the European project is in a fundamental transition. And uh, since we're all very much focusing on institutional aspects of the European integration process, we have difficulties in understanding the fundamentals, the political logic, the political fundamentals of this, um, of this uh, transition. Um, and my second starting point is 
uh, that um, the status quo as we have it is not sustainable. So the process, it, is, uh, it doesn't make any sense to try to stop the process or to keep it where we have it right now. The basic question is whether it's possible to change the course of direction, to influence the course of direction, to influence the di direction of this transition process in a way which leads to a cosmopolitan Europe, as we uh, once uh, called it. And in this regard, and this is my main argument, in this regard, politicization is key. If we want to understand if we want to understand the logic of this transformation and if we want to understand the political opportunities and constraints of this process, we must understand the logic of politicization in the European integration process. And this was why I, after finishing the book with, uh, with Ulrich, started to work on politicization and political conflict in Europe. direction. Okay. In our book, we presented basically a normative argument. The normative argument uh, and, uh, for, um, to, um, to uh, support uh, this normative argument, uh, we developed a concept of cosmopolitanism, which in some way uh, referred to earlier concepts, earlier theories in the German Enlightenment, Kant and others, but which uh, um, was distinct from these ancient classical traditions in, in important ways. Um, most important is uh, that uh, our concept of cosmopolitanism had two dimensions. The first dimension, and this was the Kantian tradition, the first dimension was cosmopolitanism as global, as universal responsibility. The second dimension, this is in a way the vertical dimension. You look to the globe. The second dimension is a horizontal dimension, and in this regard, cosmopolitanism is a concept of tolerance. It's the tolerance of difference. It's a, it's a new way, it's a new approach of dealing with otherness. And in this regard, Theodor Adorno, German sociologist and, uh, and philosopher, uh, once uh, gave a brilliant description of what, it's, uh, of what cosmopolitanism is all about without using the, uh, without using, uh, the word. He said, um, what is most important is what is most important is that it's possible of being different without fear being different without fear he wrote this uh, while he was in in his ex exile in the in the in the 1940s in the united states being different without fear and this is the vertical, uh, the, 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 the horizontal dimension, cosmopolitanism as an, uh, as, an, as an approach of dealing with difference of tolerance. We applied these, this concept with its both dimensions to Europe, the European project, and we used in particular the second dimension in order to, well, to develop a new approach of reconciling national and regional identities with European integration. The basic question still is, is it possible of being British, German, Basque and being a European at the same time? Of keeping your own regional national identity and being a European nevertheless? So our approach was not to find ways of strengthening a European identity which was supposed to replace national or regional identities, but 
to develop a concept to find ways of reconciling, of, uh, of combining, of integrating different approaches, different identities. This was the basic, the normative, uh, uh, the normative idea. And I, sti I think this is still as important and relevant in 2015 as it was in 2004. It's probably even more important if you take more, the, the more recent developments in Greek, in, in, in the UK, in Spain, and, uh, and uh, so, uh, so on. In our understanding, Europe, the European integration process from the very beginning had a cosmopolitan component. It was not a fully developed cosmopolitan project, but it had a cosmopolitan moment, a, a cosmopolitan component, because it implied the transfer of political authority from the national level to the European one. And this was unique, and it's still unique, because the European Union is the only international organization, and it's no longer an international organization, but it's the only international organization which is in command of sovereign power in specific policy areas. And this was Charmonet's basic idea to establish a high authority with authoritative powers vis-a-vis -vis the member states. An authority which is not under the control of the member states. This is the most fundamental innovation in the European integration process, and this is why everybody should be concerned if the major, if the governments of the major member states decide to weaken exactly this high authority, the Commission, at the advantage of the member states. So there was a cosmopolitan component in the integration process, but the cosmopolitan idea, the cosmopolitan the normative foundation of the European project has been weakened in the course of the integration process in several ways. Because of national interests and the use and abuse of national interests in European policy making, because of the dominance of economic um, values of market uh, uh, processes in uh, the economic uh, um, integration process. The integration process from the very beginning uh, 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 was characterized by an as asymmetry. There was, it was, uh, 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 there was put, uh, the, um, the integration process put a lot of emphasis on economic integration, whereas social integration was more or less neg neglected. It turned out to be much more complicated for political reasons to integrate Europe socially, to develop a social Europe, a social dimension of the European project, than to integrate Europe economically. And this asymmetry is, and the, the, the negative consequences of this asymmetry have become apparent in the past 10 years um, in particular. So there have been several, the European integration process, though being a cosmopolitan process from the be very beginning, has been deformed economically um, 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 uh, nationally and so on. And the, 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 the key question uh, we addressed in our book was, how is it possible to overcome these deformations? Is it possible to advance the European project as, as a cosmopolitan project, which is democratic, which uh, is... Uh, which, um, balances economic and social um, uh, uh, policies more adequately, and so on. And our... suggestion, our normative suggestion was that the deformations of this integration process can only be overcome by politicization. But not by politicization from above, by governmental elites, as we had it in the past, but by politicization 
from below, by the mobilization of civil society. And in this regard, we uh, referred to the European citizens' movement in the late 1940s. It's amazing uh, 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 to realize that there was a time when there was a European citizens' movement where hundreds of thousands of European citizens were active in favor of the European integration process and the European integration project. So, we learned from these historical developments that it is possible, in principle, to politicize the European integration process from below, that it is possible, in principle, to mobilize European citizens in favor of European integration. Point, of course, is how can we activate European citizens? How can we empower European citizens? And this was the point when I started to look at politicization in more detail, to understand the basic logics, the fundamentals of politicization. Because this was, in a way, the problem where Ulrich and I left it in the mid-2000s, uh, 10 years ago. Still doesn't work. <laughs> okay. And uh, I will not go into the details of, uh, of all the slides. Uh, I just let me sketch out the main research questions, give you a broad overview of what we did and the main, uh, the main findings. We are more interested then in the implications and the consequences for uh, uh, present-day political uh, questions. Um, we were, in fact, interested um, uh, the, the main question uh, we addressed, uh, in fact, was whether there is something like politicization. Daniel, in the introduction, said there is no politicization. Is this true? Has there never been politicization in the past? Or has there been some politicization? And if so, what are the characteristic features of this politicization? Who were the drivers? And what, was, what were the consequences of such a politicization? Was it good for the integration process or was it bad? Was it an accelerator or a break to integration? These were the questions we were looking at and we were looking at the last 40 years from the early 1970s. The whole process from, from, the, from, from the time when European integration started going again with, the, with the, the, the first enlargement, the British membership in 1973, and then all the treaty reforms, the Single European Act, the Maastricht Treaty, and so on. Uh, and we were looking at six West European countries, Austria, France, Germany, Sweden, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom. Unfortunately, we didn't include a South European country. And uh, meanwhile, we deeply regret this, but <laughs> uh, um, we uh, must leave it as it, as it, as it is. Uh, we uh, deliberately decided to include Switzerland, although it's not a member state of the European Union, but it's a country which struggled with membership issues for decades. And we were looking at public debates on the basis of daily newspapers. We were looking at, ele at uh, national election campaigns. We were looking at pub political protests, the protest arena, protest uh, events. So if, if there sh should have been politicization, we should have been able to observe it. So it um, What do we mean by politicization? That's a term uh, you've heard uh, several times already, uh, uh, definitely, but what do political scientists mean if they speak of politicization? Um, as always, uh, there is no, um, uh, no uniform <laughs> use of, uh, of the term. Um, in political sociology, Politicization means political conflict. Political conflict is at the, at the heart of politicization. 
And uh, in, this re in, in this regard, um, we have three different dimensions, uh, three different aspects of political conflict in mind. And this is the public visibility of conflict. This is what we call salience. Is a, co uh, uh, is a conflict publicly visible or uh, is it fought uh, 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 behind uh, the doors? The second uh, dimension is um, the scope of actors involved. How many actors are involved? Is it only a few or is the crowd coming in, as Elmer Schatzschneider 15 years ago called it? And then, of course, polarization, the relation between the actors. What's their relation? How intense is the conflict? How strong is polarization? And we assume politicization is, is particularly high if it's highly visible. So if you can read about an issue every day in the newspaper, if it's on the TV news every day, as the Euro crisis has been, uh, if, it is, if it includes not just governmental elites, but the mass public, and if it polarizes, if it leads to the formation of different political camps, if it leads to political opposition. This, more broadly, is what we uh, call politicization, and this is what we were looking at uh, in, uh, in, in our uh, data. And of course, you can combine the various, uh, the various um, um, uh, indicators into one index, and this is the index uh, uh, I, uh, I show you uh, later. I don't, uh, if you're interested in details, uh, you're welcome to ask in the, <laughs> in the, in the discussion. Uh, let me briefly summarize the main argument uh, so that you have a full understanding of what we found out before I go into the details. Um, I think the first point is, Yes, there has been some politicization in the past. Politicization is not a new phenomenon. Uh, the European integration uh, process has been remarkably politicized uh, in the past, in the 1970s, 1980s already. Um, but um, what we, uh, but this, is not, uh, this was not a, a uniform process, a process that you can uh, observe you know, every country to the same extent. On the contrary, there has been significant variation across countries over time. We call this punctuated politicization. I don't think that this is really an important term. What is important is it varies. And the point, of course, is what are the factors responsible for this variation? Why is politicization high? in the 1970s in the United Kingdom, and why is it very low in Germany in the 1980s and 1990s? And in this uh, regard, uh, two groups of factors um, are, impo are important. The first one uh, are uh, institutional context factors. I will exp uh, explain them uh, in detail later. The second one, and this is the more important one, are strategic choices. The strategic choices of actors. Politicization is nothing that just happens. Po politicization is something which has been decided on by political actors. And if this is the case, the key question is, which actors had the power to, see, to decide on politicization and which actors had the power to depoliticize an issue? And what are the consequences? Broadly speaking, politicization, as we had it in the past 40 years, must be considered a strategic opportunity for political actors to mobilize or to demobilize citizens. The question then is, who made use of this opportunity and for what, for, for what purposes? And in this regard, our findings 
are, have been quite frustrating for Ulrich Beck. We discussed this several times um, because politicization evidently worked in a completely different way as he had envisaged it. The opportunity, the strategic opportunity, had been mostly used by political elites and not by the citizens. And it had been mostly used by Eurosceptic parties and not by the supporters of the European integration process. And as a, uh, um, as a result, the consequences of politicization for the European integration process have not been positive, as we expected it initially in our book, but mostly negative. And in the Euro crisis, these negative consequences of politicization have become most evident because, as I will argue later, the decision of the German and the French government not to promote far-reaching treaty reforms is in some way the expression of political realism. The realism that the insight that far-reaching treaty reforms are blocked politically and they are blocked politically within major EU member states. Support for treaty reforms is frustratingly low. A British public opinion poll last year showed that among British voters only 3% supported further transfers of political authority to the European level. Now we would think, well, this is, these are the Brits. Um, they have been very special all the time. But if you take the same figures for Germany and for France, this story becomes <laughs> pretty plausible. In France, it's 10%. And in Germany, I think it's 11 or 12 percent. So it's just, it's, it's, it's a small minority of the citizens who at present support additional transfers of political authority to the European level. In, in particular, in fields of economic integration. It's different if you look at foreign policy, we, we will uh, come to this. Uh, we will come to this uh, later. If this is the case, then of course, governments in, these, in those countries in which national refer referenda are mandatory, or national referenda have to be conceded politically, are most like, the outcomes of these referenda are most likely to be negative. And since we, uh, 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 and since treaty reforms need un 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 consensus. <laughs> this is, since, since 20 years I try to pronounce this word <laughs> and I hate it. <laughs> since we need consensus and a single member state can block um, uh, every treaty reform. It's... Uh, 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 the uncertainty, the political uncertainty of, uh, uh, of a negative outcome of a treaty reform is extremely high. So this is the basic, the basic, uh, um, um, uh, the basic scenario. Um, let me show you a f uh, uh, just a few f uh, slides uh, uh, to give you some empirical background. Um, this is the development of politicization uh, in national elections. And, you see, and uh, what is important is, is this line, because this is, uh, this is the average of 
domestic issues, welfare, security, foreign policy, um, uh, whatever it is. This is the average. So politicization is high if it's above this benchmark and it's low if it's below this benchmark. And you see, in the whole period to the Maastricht, to the Maastricht Treaty, it was hardly an issue in national elections, with exceptions, of course. And then there is a remarkable increase in the post-Maastricht period and a decline in the, in the, in the 2000s. This table shows that it is still mainly, it's still dominated by governmental elites. This is once again the benchmark, uh, extra expansion as we had it in other, uh, on other issues, uh, if, um, <coughs> is, is lower as we have it in other issues. But, and this is the most important uh, uh, aspect, polarization on European issues have been steadily increasing. And um, um, uh, European issues are more polarizing, meanwhile, than more polarizing than average uh, domestic issues. So this is, in a way, a political potential. This is a re political resource politicians can use. It, they know it is polarizing. If we address the issue, it's polarizing. The question is, shall we address it or not? And you see here that the question, shall we address it or not, has been, uh, uh, has been answered in very different ways in the various countries. You see here again the benchmark you see, on one hand, Germany. In Germany, European integration has not been an issue until the mid-2000s. It was a non-issue in, in national elections for decades. There was only one exception. Mostly uh, the election in 2005. What happened? It was uh, the beginning of membership negotiations with Turkey. It was the Turkey, uh, uh, the issue of Turkey's EU membership that was politicizing. And this debate was one of the most polarized debates we, we observed in the whole sample we had. And you can see from this incident how polarizing and politicizing European issues could be in Germany if political parties would dare to touch upon the issue. You see, Sweden is a country, this is the membership debate in Sweden. Apart from this, Europe is not an issue. In the Nordic countries, Europe is not an issue. And you see, you see the United Kingdom, and you see in the United Kingdom these peaks. And these peaks are remarkable. This was, uh, this was the, uh, the, the national election in 1997 in which Europe was a major issue, one of the most, uh, one of the most, uh, most salient issues. You also see uh, that Europe in the 1970s and 1980s was an important issue in British elections. You see that in France, except for the, uh, for the, for the presidential election, these are presidential elections in France, 2007, Europe was not an issue in national debates. And you see Switzerland, we, have the, we find the highest levels of politicization in Switzerland. It's not a member, uh, me member country, but membership was extremely polarizing, and it is still polarizing. This is the same for all the integration debates. I don't want to go into details. Some of them look like medieval Italian towns, this could be San Gimignano, it's not, it's Austria. Um, and uh, what is important for us is that the picture is completely different. The pattern is completely different. You see here France, in national elections, presidential elections, no politicization. And you see here, northern enlargement. That was British, the debate on, on Britain's EU membership 
was one of the most politicized public debates in the European <laughs> Union ever. And it was extremely controversial in, 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 in France. And this is the French debate on the Maastricht Treaty. The, the, the strongest politicization we found in a, in, a, in, a, in a public debate, even compared to the Euro crisis, was uh, the French debate uh, on, uh, on the Maastricht Treaty. You once again see that Germany doesn't look like a medieval town at all, because there are no such strongly politicizing uh, 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 events. You also see that Compared to France, uh, the British debates were not that politicized. The public debate was not. It was, we, we, we can't assume that in the UK there was a, 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 um, um, a, um, a broad-based public, um, uh, public move, uh, uh, political movement. Uh, and you see in, in, in Austria and Switzerland, um, the peaks, uh, the, 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 the dark bars are the, the membership debates, these peaks in the, member, in the, in the membership uh, ship debate. So we find completely different patterns in national elections and in, and in public debates. And uh, this, of course, is, it's, it's a bit difficult to interpret, but, um, well, no, it's not difficult to interpret, it's difficult to, uh, to grasp the essence from just looking at the, <laughs> at the graphs. Uh, these are, uh, this is the protest arena. Uh, of course, you, what you see uh, is uh, the number of protest events and the number of participants. Um, what we don't have is, um, is, is a benchmark here. If we would use an, a, a benchmark, you would immediately see that Europe is not politicizing in the protest arena. And this is extremely frustrating <laughs> for those who, uh, 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 who want uh, to encourage politicization from below, who want to activate citizens, um, uh, who want, uh, um, um, who want uh, uh, the European citizens um, um, to, uh, um, um, uh, to articulate protest in the streets. Um, European integration it has not been mobilizing thus far. And uh, what is, uh, um, if you take the number of the protest events, if we draw, uh, if we draw a line, we would even see uh, that protest has been rather declining in the 2000s than increasing. We would have expected a completely different development. We would ha have expected an increase in protest as a response to uh, the increasing transfer of political authority to the European level. This simply didn't happen. So the pattern we found, if we look at, um, at these developments in the various arenas, was quite puzzling. There was something, but it didn't meet any expectation. In particular, it didn't meet the expectations we formulated in, uh, in, uh, in our book. And, uh, of course, the question then is, uh, how can we explain uh, these, uh, these findings? What's going on? When is Europe politicizing and when is it not politicizing? Evidently, the transfer of authority to the European institutions plays a role. The Maastricht Treaty is, um, is, is the major example. If major transfers of political authority are controversial in some countries, but not in all countries. It was not an issue in Germany, although the Germans had to give up their Deutsche Mark. And it was highly controversial in France, although the French at that time assumed to be the main beneficiaries of these uh, developments. Obviously, the transfer of political authority as such doesn't explain that much. There must be something in addition, and uh, it's, uh, uh, as I already mentioned, the actors and their mobilization uh, uh, strategies and the political opportunity structures in which these, uh, these, uh, uh, these actors uh, have to operate. And in this regard, it's 
obvious that the most important actors are political parties. At least until 2015, and maybe it, the situation changes, but at least until 2015, uh, political parties have been the main drivers. But we can envisage different constellations. Initially, authors assumed that it's the Eurosceptic parties that mobilize most successfully. This is not the case. If, if you look at, uh, at the developments, you see that uh, it's three different constellations that are mobilizing, or three different constellations in which political parties to decide, decide to mobilize. One of these com constellations is um, um, competition between government and opposition. This is the British situation where the ma two major parties competed for offices and they strategically used European issues whenever it, they seemed, uh, 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 thought it would be appropriate, useful for them. And if they thought it wouldn't be useful, they decided not to use them, as we had it in the last election uh, early this month, when Europe was not an issue in the election campaign, although it was an extremely important issue for the electorate. This was a strategic decision to depoliticize an issue in a, in a campaign. And you had the same in the, in the last German national election when Europe was not an issue during the campaign. In the French presidential election in 2012, you had the opposite, uh, the opposite outcome. The second constellation is, in fact, when Opposing parties, radical right parties and Eurosceptic parties mobilize against Europe. Switzerland is the best example. France is an example. Austria is an example. There are countries in which, uh, in which Europe is a strategic resource, the politicization of Europe is a strategic resource for radical parties. And the last European election has shown this uh, uh, quite uh, clearly. And so, of course, it is extremely dangerous to touch upon the issue in an election. And the third, this is, uh, the third pattern, this is the one we find in Germany. This is uh, in, in the campaign on the Euro crisis. If there is conflict within the governing parties, in the last coalition government, there were intense conflicts within each of these parties, the CDU, the CSU, the, F, the Liberals. And these conflicts contributed substantially to the politicization of the issue. That's one thing. And the second thing is the institutional opportunity. And in this regard, national referendums are the most important opportunity to politicize European integration issues. The towers in the medieval Italian towns are those public debates in, uh, 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 in which a national referendum was integrated. Whenever you have a national referendum, you can expect extraordinarily high levels of politicization. If you want to politicize European integration, hold a national referendum. That's the basic message. But holding a refer national referendum is extremely dangerous politically because it's not possible to control the cause and the outcome of this process. And we have seen this in Ireland several times. And we have seen this in France in, 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 in 1992. We have seen this in France in 2005. National referendums have become the most important threat to European integration. This is kind... This is kind of a democratic paradox because it's democratic participation of the citizens in the member states, which actually leads to the highest levels of politicization and tends to block European integration politically.
And as a result, politicization has been eroding political support for European integration, and it has been increasing political uncertainty on popular support for further authority transfers. Decisions on the reform of the monetary union, decisions on the further development of the Eurozone have to take place in the shadow of this political uncertainty, in the shadow of politicization. And in this context, political elites, the French, the German government, decided to depoliticize the issue whenever possible. And they did so by avoiding treaty reforms which would have implied a national referendum. And they did so by delegating unpopular decisions to the European Central Bank, to institutions which are not under political control. Not, at least not under direct political control. The consequence is exactly what Jürgen Habermas uh, uh, called the technocratic Europe. It's the technocratic Europe, it's der Sog der Technokratie, which, um, uh, which results from, uh, from this. It's the, 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 the technocratic deformation of uh, European integration. And it actually reinforces asymmetries among member states. The big ones, it's the, French and the, it's the French and the German. It's not just the German Europe, it's the big ones. Uh, it's the French and the, uh, uh, and, uh, and the Germans uh, which dominate the, the agenda and the course, uh, and, uh, the course uh, of, uh, of events. So, and this is the, and uh, this is um, uh, now the kind of a normative conclusion uh, I would like to offer, something I would call the paradox of uh, politicization. Because, uh, uh, frankly, uh, before I met Ulrich, uh, I would have stopped here and ended with the, uh, with the pessimistic outlook. I say, well, the world isn't good. Uh, this is uh, uh, um, how we have it. Uh, Ulrich, Ulrich learned me not to stop with a negative outlook. Uh, there must be some... He, remember the, 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 the picture. He's an optimist. So there must be some optimistic outlook. So, but where's the optimistic outlook? Um, the optimistic outlook is again a paradox. I started with a paradox, I will, uh, I will end with a paradox. The optimistic outlook is, uh, is uh, something I would call the paradox of politicization. Because depoliticization is not an option. Um, and the point is that, um, uh, that the present situation is not, as I mentioned in the beginning, the present situation is not sustainable. We are in the middle of a, trans, uh, of, of a transformation, and uh, the pro if, if, if the process continues as we have it, it will lead to disintegration, both economically and politically. So the point is not whether we, uh, uh, we prefer the status quo instead of thumb, uh, something, uh, something else. We can't keep the status quo. It is changing anyway. It's deteriorating. The point is how we, uh, uh, how we, uh, okay. <laughs> the, po the point is how we can, uh, uh, can overcome the situation. Is there a possibility uh, to escape this politicization trap? Is there a possibility? Uh, no, 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 it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> is there a uh, no figures on it anyway. Is there a possibility to escape this politicization trap? Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, um, uh, the answer for me would be yes. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the normative conclusion would be uh, what we need is not depoliticization, but this is the option the governmental elites uh, go for right now, but more politicization, but a different kind of politicization, something I, call, uh, I, uh, I would call counter-politicization. Uh, counter
And counter-politicization uh, um, uh, would not just mean off, uh, uh, offering different solutions uh, to the criticism of Eurosceptic um, um, uh, opponents of European integration, as we had it right now, and this is, uh, and we know that this is unsatisfactory. Um, uh, the moderate, uh, the moderate right parties uh, encounter these problems because, uh, um, uh, in their, um, if they adapt uh, to um, the. Um, um, uh, the, uh, the strategies, the mobilizing strategies uh, of uh, the populist right, uh, they lose out because uh, in, uh, in some way the original is always more impressive uh, than uh, a moderate copy. Um, so this was, uh, for good reasons, the British conservatives decided not to touch upon the issue because they, uh, they, would, uh, they uh, would not have been uh, won the competition with UKIP on European issues in, in the last election. The point is, uh, counter-mobilization means we need a different, a different framing of European integration. This is something you will discuss in the, in the next presentation in, uh, in detail. I wouldn't call it a new narrative, uh, but a, a, a new framing, a new discourse on European integration. And the, dis, uh, the, the, the discourses on the reform of the European uh, integration thus far suffered from the fact that they were partial, they focused on specific aspects, um, uh, financial redistribution, uh, institu uh, changes in the institutional framework, and so on. There was no strategic plan, there was no strategic vision, uh, and um, so none of these, uh, none of these uh, uh, plans uh, was really uh, convincing uh, uh, anyway. Uh, a last, uh, a last, uh, um, a last uh, remark, uh, how could such, a, and we probably can discuss this um, later anyway. Um, uh, how can we find uh, the, um, the point uh, uh, where we can, f uh, where we can um, identify and formulate such a counter uh, uh, mobilization strategy? In my understanding, uh, Ulrich Beck's work once again is the key. Uh, in, uh, the, um, his theory of risk society emphasizes angst, fear. The key concept, if you read the introductory chapter of Risk Society, the key concept is fear. The new quality and the fear is the, is the result of uncertainty. Our second modern society is a society characterized by uncertainties. And the main, the basic question is, how can we cope with these uncertainties? Uncertainties produce fear. And these fears can easily be exploited by populist parties. But what's the alternative? The alternative, obviously, is to directly address these uncertainties. And this holds both for economic uncertainties, this holds for political uncertainties, this holds for uh, uh, uncertainties created by war and terrorism, this holds for un un uncertainties and fears because of um, uh, uh, um, loss of national or regional identities and so on. There are lots of sources for uncertainty and uh, for fears. And uh, um, uh, at the moment, the very open question is whether the European Union, the European integration process, is part of the problem or part of the solution. Whether it is a source of uncertainty or whether it will take away these uncertainties, address the fears. So think, for example, about a European guaranteed minimum income. If economic uncertainty because of economic crisis is one of the main sources of uncertainty and fear, how can we address this? 
Obviously not by transferring huge amounts of money to corrupt governments. What's the alternative? How can European citizens benefit from such a transfer of money? If we don't want to advocate national egoism and say we, will we want to keep our money, that's the, that's the, the, the right-wing populist response. Our money for our people. This was the slogan of the, uh, of the Austrian uh, um, uh, populists. Our money for our people. We don't want to share. A solidaristic response would mean, well, yes, we want to share. But how and with whom and in which way? And how can the European Union contribute to such a scheme? Make it a European scheme not just benefits of the German government to the Greeks, something like this. And how can we, for example, develop a European response to the fear, the new fears of war in East Europe, the new problems of migration, asylum seekers in Europe, a European response not just national responses, and a European response that's solidaristic, not the British way of bombing the boats in the Mediterranean. That's an option, but is it a solidaristic option? So I think there are, there, 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 there are many components that can be made essential parts of a counter-strategy, of a new framework of a U for a European project that directly addresses the uncertainties of fears, the real and realistic fears and uncertainties of European citizens in the age of uncertainty, because risk society basically is the age of uncertainty. And how can we cope with the challenges in this age of uncertainty. The European, the, the Euro, Euro crisis is one of the test cases of the ability and the willingness of European citizens, not elites. Elites are frustrating. This is something we learned from Ulrich. Don't um, go for the elites. Count on the citizens. How can European citizens um, get engaged uh, for such a project? That's the key problem, that's the fundamental problem uh, of, uh, of Ulrich uh, Beck's uh, whole work. And think back of the picture. He, did, uh, um, he, he was a paradox in himself. He, he wrote frightening books on risk society. And he nevertheless was an optimist all the time. Keep him, keep him in mind as an optimist with the fan scarf of Munich. Okay, thank you. Muchas gracias, Edgar. Danke schön, Oscar Casco. Tenemos un tiempo. Amplio para la discusión, la, las preguntas. Eh, hay unas preguntas elaboradas por <coughs> alumnos del Instituto Usanizada Piña Florida, pero primero quería dar la, la voz a los que están aquí presentes. También vía Twitter se, se nos pueden enviar preguntas. Eh, ¿Hay alguna pregunta del público? Sí. Esperamos un momento. Um, I just wondered why uh, you hadn't mentioned the media and the press at all in the process of politicization. Because you identified the political parties, but as key players or key 
drivers, I think you called them. But what about the press all over Europe? The press and the, the media, they, they're controlling all the information we have. And the other part of the question is about transparency of Europe. People are frightened because there's very little transparency. And one example at the moment is the trade, the transatlantic trade investment partnership. Nobody has a clue about what's being negotiated behind closed doors. And sorry, third part of this one question, sorry, is that you said we, we, you used we throughout the talk. And maybe I'm being silly, but I'm not sure exactly who you mean by we. I'll start with the, uh, with the last part, we. Uh, I think it has different, um, uh, different uh, um, uh, meanings. We uh, could on the one hand mean Ulrich and I because we wrote the book together. Uh, it also, of course, means we, the team of researchers who did the, the research on which uh, the, the, the data is presented. And then, of course, we means we, uh, the European citizens. Uh, so <laughs> this might be confusing. <laughs> Uh, but um, I apologize uh, uh, for, uh, for this. Uh, second, uh, transparency, uh, intransparency, yes, uh, and uh, this is a serious problem. This is one of the, uh, one of the sources of uncertainty, I mean. Uh, um, uh, there are good reasons why European citizens are afraid of this European Union. It is intransparent. It, uh, and uh, it is unclear whether, it's, uh, whether the outcomes of decisions are really beneficial for European citizens. TTIP is a perfect example of how not to do it, because this is exactly the way of frightening people. Even if uh, in, in the very end it would turn out not to be negative on balance, it's not the way you can, this is not the way you can do it. And uh, by the way, we learn time and again how, uh, how politicians use lies when it's appropriate. The Germans now learn that their government, uh, of course, uh, didn't tell the truth two years ago when it came to the espionage uh, uh, affair and uh, the, the, um, um, the American relations to the American government. Okay. So last year in the election campaign, Ms. Merkel said, you can trust me. You know who I am. Now we know, no, we can't trust her. Uh, and um, so uh, this is exactly the way you can't do it. And uh, media, I understand media are part of the problem. But on the other hand, they are still the most important, uh, the most important source of establishing a European uh, public sphere. There is no alter in this case, there is no alternative. I know that there are social media, but they still don't have the same importance as, uh, uh, as uh, the, the, the established media, the print media, uh, uh, TV. But uh, we always have to keep in mind that they might be biased. They are not neutral uh, providers of, uh, of information. They are part of the game and they're using and abusing information uh, uh, and their relations to, uh, to politicians. So uh, House of Cards is quite realistic, I would think, in this regard. ¿Cómo es posible que siendo un tema tan importante casi no se hable de ello en la educación, de, en la educación pública de nuestro país? Well, I, uh, uh, of course, I can't comment on public uh, on public education in in uh, in, in Spain, uh, but. Um, 
In, um, in Germany, it is part of the curriculum in, in, in schools at, and at, at universities. Um, the point is, uh, um, uh, the point is rather um, to, pre to, uh, to present a critical um, uh, perspective on this, because uh, our school books, for example, um, just um, represent uh, the standard uh, governmental rhetoric. So that's the uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, the conventional. Um, presentation of the institutional framework and of policy processes in Europe. Um, so, so, but uh, I, would, uh, I would think that, uh, uh, but I fully agree uh, that uh, it, is, it would be extremely important uh, to educate uh, citizens on politics in general and to make European integration an integral part of this civic education. Europe is important, civic education um, uh, uh, should cover it systematically, probably, probably more systematically as, as it does right now. Um, I'd like to raise the issue of uh, participation and legitimacy of, legitimacy of, of these um, participation processes in terms of, um, as we all know, uh, the elections, European Union-wide elections, let's say the European Parliament elections, uh, the participation uh, percentage of the population is very low, not even 40% of people vote. Um, and also I'd like to raise also another issue and ask you for your opinion on the following. Um, what about the uh, European Union's populations, uh, expatriates, the diaspora living uh, outside of the European Union borders? Uh, at least there are 80 million people who are Europeans who live outside of the European uh, Union member state. Uh, many, many uh, young Europeans are living, uh, working in Australia, in the US, in America, in other parts of the world. And so they are not uh, engaged in all these processes. Uh, let's let's uh, make an example. Um, when the Scottish people were um, um, actually asked for a vote, the Scottish uh, diaspora were not allowed. They, they did not uh, have uh, the right to vote. Uh, people of, of the um, of other other um, communities, other na nations, uh, uh, were were not engaged in all these processes. So, how, in the long term, how can th uh, that all this affect the uh, European Union's integration process? Thank you very much. Well, uh, the question has uh, it, it two components. One component is uh, the question: Who's an who's a European citizen and who should be allowed to participate in uh, democratic procedures. Um, and in this regard, uh, the procedures right, right now might be incomplete and unfair to some extent. But uh, the major problem are not the eight millions that uh, are not fully uh, included in these procedures, um, but um, uh, the, uh, the, I would think, 150 millions that do not participate in elections. Um, so if we have an election turnout uh, of, uh, of 40 percent, uh, this is, of course, um, uh, extremely frustrating um, and delegitimizing uh, because, meanwhile, the European Parliament is one of the most powerful parliaments in the world. It still has not the full authority of, uh, of, a, uh, of a parliament, but nevertheless, it's one of, meanwhile one of, the most, most one of the most powerful parliaments in the world. And um, if we look at uh, election turnouts, uh, we find that something I, we could call a democratic, uh, um, a democratic dilemma, because, or a paradox. The more powerful the European Parliament got, the lower election turnout was. Actually, we would have expected exactly the different development. The idea, the very idea from the, the, the idea from the very beginning was, um, the, the, if um, the European Parliament gets more power, people will take it more important and 
more people will go to the elections. And when uh, the first election turnouts were unsatisfactory, the uh, conclusion was, well, the European Parliament is not powerful enough. We, need, we must strengthen the European Parliament. We've done this time and again. With every treaty reform, we strengthened the European Parliament and the turnout went down nevertheless. So evidently, there's something wrong. And uh, the question is, what's wrong? In my opinion, it's the lack of a European party system. Elections are only legitimizing, they are only transferring decision-making out, decision output into political support if there, is, if there is political parties. And there are no European political parties. The European party system is underdeveloped. It's still very weak associations of parliamentary clubs and it's still associations of national parties. And as long, and uh, this has a consequence. The consequence is that European decisions tend to be instrumentalized by national parties and by national elites in their, in their domestic decision-making processes. So there is no functioning chain of legitimization at the European level which would lead from the European, uh, European citizen, uh, European citizen uh, to European institutions and backwards. And as long as this is the case, parliamentary, uh, and uh, the, the, the implication is that the model of parliamentary democracy, as we have established it at the European level, is obviously inappropriate to fully legitimize European decision-making processes. Question, of course, is are there alternatives? I will leave it <laughs> here right now. I, I, I sh um, shouldn't uh, talk uh, too long. Um, give others the, the chance to ask questions. Sí, ¿qué le gusta que existan lobbies de presión? Antes hablaba la señora sobre el papel de los medios de comunicación, el papel de los medios económicos ya lo conocemos, no hace falta revolver más. ¿Qué le gusta que hay, eh, existen lobbies de presión y en su caso los lobbies de presión dirigen, orientan hacia un, unas actuaciones concretas eh, el, futuro, el presente y el futuro de Europa? Well, there certainly are uh, lobbies and uh, they are certainly uh, important. Uh, they are in, uh, an integral part of the European decision-making process. I just read a, a, a dissertation of a, a doctor student of mine uh, on lobbying activities of the German uh, automobile industry uh, in the 2000s. They are highly instructive and they show how the, uh, how the, uh, <coughs> the main uh, producers um, Mercedes and so on, systematically addressed uh, um, institutions both at the national and the European level. Um, and um, the European institutions, the Commission in particular, is rather open uh, uh, for um, well, this kind of communication. Let's um, um, label it that way. Um, the point is that um, Lobbying at the European, or lobbying in the European Union, has uh, specific features which is which are distinct from uh, lobbying at the national level, and uh, they reinforce and strengthen asymmetries between uh, social interests that we know from uh, national politics already. What does this mean? Um, it means that. Um, 
European associations are comparably weak, com uh, are rather weak compared to national associations. They are associations of associations because of the multi-layered structure of, European, of the European Union. And this multi-layered structure means uh, that um, the, there is a, um, there's more hetero heterogeneity of interests as we have it in, at the national level. Trade unions suffer most from this because this is one of the reasons why trade unions at the European level are so weak because uh, they suffer from the heterogeneity of, uh, of uh, national labor, uh, labor, labor movements. Business has, um, uh, has a strategy uh, to counteract these, uh, these difficulties, and this is, of course, uh, the possibility of, of, uh, of, uh, of companies, of individual companies, to lobby European uh, institutions. Um, uh, so as a result, there is a, an asymmetry uh, in favor of economic interests. The European decision-making process um, is more advantages to the lobbying of economic interests. And uh, it is more advantages to lobbying strategies of big companies. Um, you're more, uh, the, the, the more you can use the strategic opportunities offered by the, by the multi-layered complex decision-making process, the more influential you are. And it's only the big players that have the resources and the capacities to use these strategic opportunities. So the European, the multi-layered structure of European decision-making processes privilege certain interests against others. And it's the economic interests and it's the big companies uh, uh, which are privileged in this process. This is very well documented in the literature, meanwhile, um, and um, it is one of the features of uh, this, uh, uh, this process. You can't understand the, uh, the establishment of a single market in the 1980s, the establishment of the big technology projects in the late 1980s, early 1990s, without the knowledge of uh, the formal and informal um, um, uh, influence uh, of the big corporations on European decision-making processes. Como decía al principio, eh, tenemos preguntas de los estudiantes del Instituto Sandizaga Peña Florida, gran instituto, ahí acabé yo el bachillerato, eh, la clase 4Q, estudiantes de 15 y 16 años, 24 estudiantes, eh, con el profesor Imanol Álvarez Varela, clase de ética, que han hecho unas cuantas preguntas y hay una pregunta que me parece muy similar a otra que acabamos de recibir vía Twitter, que me permito trasladar a, a profesor Grande, la, la, la pregunta número 8, la última. ¿Es necesaria una identidad nacional, cultural y cultural común para uni una Unión Europea en lo político? La pregunta número 8. Y hay una pregunta muy similar en Twitter. ¿Cuánto de la politización de Europa depende de que la ciudadanía traslade su identidad nacional a la Unión Europea? um, uh, of the book I wrote with Ulrich Beck, The Cosmopolitan Europe, because um, you said Ulrich was an idealist. In this regard, he was not an idealist, but a realist. Um, uh, the, 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 um, the whole book um, was based on the premise uh, that Europe was, that Europe uh, was, uh, has been, uh, 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 was founded on common interests and not on a common identity. This, this is what we call cosmopolitan realism. 
And um, um, for this reason, we also thought that um, a European identity or the strengthening of a European identity would not lead, uh, would not be the appropriate way of strengthening Europe. I wouldn't say that a European identity is completely irrelevant, but it's at least risky and dangerous. Um, I wrote an article a couple of years ago, U European identity, a dangerous obsession. And I wrote this uh, article in the context of the German debate uh, on Turkey's EU membership. This debate was remarkable because in this debate, um, um, the critics of Turkey's EU membership constructed an opposition between, on the one hand, the owners of a European identity, and this was the Christian identity, the European identity, the we, the Europeans, against the Turks. And the Turks, they are not, the Euro they are not Europeans. They are not part of us. They are the Islam. That's, or, uh, that's something completely different. So European identity in this debate was instrumentally used to, uh, to close Europe, to construct something like a fortress Europe. And in my, uh, in my understanding, uh, this is, uh, uh, this is um, uh, dangerous. Um, and this is not uh, compatible with the basic, ide the basic idea of openness and tolerance, uh, which we um, uh, described as one of the fundamentals of uh, cosmopolitanism. Uh, in the next step, of course, uh, um, I mentioned that we, uh, we had a, um, a, a quite a unique uh, a concept of cosmopolitanism, which was uh, a combination uh, of, uh, on the one hand, uh, what we called cosmopolitan values, uh, the, the tolerance of otherness, and uh, some basic universal uh, values. It was not complete, uh, in complete opposition to universal uh, values. And then, of course, we encountered the question, what are these indispensable common values? If there is something we need to have in common. And, um, and uh, uh, um, um, the question would be, uh, are there some basic common European values that are indispensable for a common European project. I would think, yes, there are, uh, there are such values, um, and they, uh, they would uh, um, mainly be based on historical experiences uh, coming from Enlightenment and French Revolution on the one hand, and uh, the tragedies of the 20th century, um, the German atrocities, uh, and so on. As the Holocaust, these are uh, the, uh, the, the consequences, um, uh, um, some of uh, the positive and negative consequences, the dialectics of, uh, of enlightenment, uh, uh, in a way, uh, which, uh, are in, uh, which can, in my understanding, uh, be used as a, as a normative minimum for a European identity. But it's just a minimum. And I don't, uh, and uh, I wouldn't use this as a political strategy to strengthen a European identity. Cosmopolitan, a cosmopolitan Europe is a Europe which tries to find a way to um, um, uh, to, uh, to tolerate the coexistence of different national and regional identities, and sometimes local identities, not to replace them by a European identity. This would be a, a, a fatal mistake. So there is a brief answer to the eighth question, and the brief answer is no. Si puedo yo añadir una cosa, un comentario que tiene que ver también con la interpretación que yo hago de lo que Ulrich Beck decía junto con Edgar Grande, en relación con la identidad política, no es que la cuestión de la identidad, entendida la identidad como pasado, 
algo que nos diferencia de los demás o como raíz sea irrelevante. Lo que, eh, el giro que Ulrich Beck eh, plantea es que, lo que nos, los temas decisivos vienen definidos no por el pasado o por la peculiaridad, sino por la afectación. Los riesgos afectan a un grupo de personas. Ese grupo, grupo de personas no son los nacionales, solo los nacionales o todos los nacionales. Hay obreros que tienen, o, o homosexuales que tienen intereses que les vinculan a través de las fronteras y hay riesgos que tienen que ver con, por ejemplo, el, el ejemplo que ponía de, inicialmente de Chernobyl. Chernobyl. La nube radioactiva de Chernobyl no se detuvo en la frontera de Alemania Oriental. Eh, el cambio climático no puede ser prohibido en Guipúzcoa. No tendría sentido que el nuevo gobierno foral lo prohibiera. Bueno, lo puede hacer, pero en fin, se reiría del gobierno. Entonces, eh, yo creo que hay como dos planos. Hay el plano de la identidad, que tiene su propia lógica y su propia dinámica y no tiene por qué ser es, eh, radicalmente amenazado por otras cosas, y el plano de la afectación de los riesgos. Y los riesgos nos unen a los que estamos amenazados por ese mismo peligro. Si yo he entendido bien. ¿no? Bueno, hay, hay otro conjunto de problemas que tienen que ver con la relación entre política y economía en Europa y que me permitiría sintetizar serían las tres primeras preguntas de los estudiantes de Usandizaga, Piña, Florida, por cómo completar en lo político lo que se ha hecho más o menos en el plano económico. ¿En qué sentido podríamos hablar de una culminación, de, un, de completar el euro, entiendo yo, de cómo hacer esa transformación institucional que aquello que hemos conseguido medianamente en lo económico sea también posible en, lo, en el plano político. Well, these are the very big questions in the end. Um, let me um, add um, a few sentences on uh, the relation between, uh, in a way, interests and uh, identity. Um, it is important, uh, um, in, in fact, uh, um, um, uh, to acknowledge that um, Ulrich Peck um, mainly argued uh, that um, globalization risk society produced new threats and uh, as a consequence of these new threats we are all members of a community of fate, a global community of fate with common interests. This is what he called the cosmopolitan imperative. Of course, the question is whether the, such a cosmopolitan imperative is strong enough to bind people together. In a critical deviation from our common course, I argued that this is not enough. There need to be some core values, some common values. Um, on which such a cosmopolitan community, a community can be based. Imperatives are not enough. But this is, this is, uh, this is uh, a point of for controversy. Uh, it's, uh, um, um, Ulrich's work is in many ways uncompleted and it's in many ways controversial. So this is one of the points where controversy is, in my view, appropriate. Um, now, the future of the European project. Um, I think, and this immediately follows from what I uh, said before, that uh, we are in a state of transition and the status quo uh, is, uh, is, um, um, is not... Um, Um, uh, uh, cannot be uh, defended. Um, the point is uh, in which direction uh, can this uh, lead and what are the preconditions uh, for, well, let's 
call it a cosmopolitan Europe. Um, I think a political union, in fact, is key to this. And all the proposals made by Jürgen Habermas and others are in this way um, fully appropriate. Uh, so, uh, and political union uh, inevit inevitably means additional transfers of political authority in some fields. You cannot, uh, uh, you cannot have an economic and monetary union without substantial supranational competencies in economic and fiscal policy. This was, uh, uh, this was unrealistic from the very beginning. Of course, there is some, uh, 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 you can think of variation in the scope of authority. The more homogeneous a currency area is, the weaker these authorities can be. The Economic and Monetary Union, as it was established in the 1990s, was the worst of all worlds. It combined an extremely heterogeneous currency area with very weak political authority in, fiscal, uh, in economic and fiscal policy. This is something that cannot work. And you can, uh, you have two options uh, to cope with, the, uh, to deal with the problem. One option is to give up the currency, uh, the common uh, currency area, or to split it up, or whatever, whatever. That's one possibility, to make it more homogeneous. And the second option is to strengthen supranational authority. There is no third way. There is an alternative, but there is no third, uh, third way. Um, the, uh, the point is, uh, 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 the, the question then, of course, is how can we persuade not only the political elites, but the European citizens that such a transfer of authority is necessary? That's the point. And um, my proposal in, in, in the end of the presentation uh, of, uh, well, basically, uh, m my argument in the end of the presentation was that you only can convince European citizens if you offer them, uh, if you offer them a big bargain, a big deal, not just single measures, a big deal. And uh, 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 the big deal has to address their key problems, the key problems of, of citizens, not just the monetary union. And in this context, um, political participation, the introduction of a European referendum, a real European referendum, is indispensable. This is something uh, we suggested in our book already. Um, and um, uh, um, the more I learned on the, on, the, on the political mechanisms of politicization, the, the, uh, the, the destructive role of national referenda, the more I'm convinced that we need these European referenda. It's, it's, uh, um, uh, this is, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, another part. And as I, as I said, we need, uh, um, we, we are right in the middle of a huge transfer of, um, of fiscal resources uh, from richer to, uh, um, um, uh, to poorer European, uh, to poor European countries. There is no way to avoid this. And all the re political rhetoric uh, in Germany, uh, which always um, um, emphasized that uh, the German citizens don't have to give one euro to the Greeks, it's just, uh, it's just loans, we don't lose the money. That's bullshit. Uh, of course, uh, we, uh, we will, uh, the G uh, German citizens will, uh, will lose the money. The problem is not that there is a transfer of money. The problem is uh, that um, citizens, both in the, in, the, in the richer and in the poorer countries, suffer from the crisis. And they are the losers of the crisis. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, what we um, uh, and they both uh, uh, suffer from insecurities, the loss of jobs, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the loss of their pensions, uh, and so on. The problem is, how can we address this? 
Um, and uh, it's interesting to see that there are several uh, plans around, meanwhile. Um, and uh, the, the Franco-German uh, paper suggested uh, a European minimum wage. That's not, uh, uh, that's not really a good offer for people who don't have a job. If uh, 25, 30 percent of, uh, of, uh, of the citizens don't have a job, a minimum wage is not the, pro is, is not the solution to their problem. Um, uh, so, uh, um, uh, in, in my view, uh, um, a guaranteed European, um, a, Euro a guaranteed income, a guaranteed minimum income, a European guaranteed income is much more conducive to the problem because it directly addresses the problem of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the European citizens, of a significant minority of European citizens. So these are uh, just uh, components of such a big deal. It also implies a, a, um, a transfer of authority in some fields back to, you, uh, to, to the member states. The British government is not completely wrong. Um, uh, 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 the European integration process, as we had it in the past decades, uh, was based on, uh, in, in some uh, areas, on false premises. Namely, the premises uh, that European policies are only effective if every member state participates. This is not true. There are areas uh, in which European policies can be effective e uh, uh, if only. Uh, uh, say uh, a critical mass of member state participates and contributes to programs. Research and technology is a, is, is, is a good example. There are policy areas in which, in fact, every member state must participate, otherwise a European policy will not work. And uh, most of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the pillars of the internal market in this regard, uh, uh, are in fact um, not negotiable. But we have different logics of cooperation uh, at work, and uh, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, Méthode Monet didn't consider these differences really uh, um, um, systematically. And so there is some case for a, uh, for a retransfer uh, of uh, authority to member states for, uh, for some kind of a more differentiated, more flexible integration. This is something Ulrich and I call the cosmop uh, uh, um, uh, a cosmopolitan integration approach, uh, which, uh, which allows for more difference, for more flexibility. Yo añadiría una cosa, eh, ¿a qué se debe la...? O sea, tendríamos que hacer un análisis correcto de cuál es la causa que explica que en las últimas elecciones europeas haya habido el resultado que ha habido, como consecuencia del cual hay un grupo muy amplio de eurodiputados que son anti-europeos o anti-integracionistas, anti especialmente los que proceden de del Frente Nacional en Francia y del UKIP en, en Gran Bretaña. Y me parece que la interpretación corriente que se suele hacer, común, es eh, entenderlo como una regresión la, hacia lo nacional, darle una explicación nacionalista. A mí me parece que la explicación de ese movimiento es más bien social. Es decir, ¿por qué Marine Le Pen en Francia consigue que el partido, el Frente Nacional, pase de ser un partido pequeño, eh, neofascista, extremo, a un partido al que vota la clase trabajadora. Esa es la gran transformación, esa es la gran incógnita, esa es la gran, la, la, lo más inquietante del asunto. Pues yo creo que fundamentalmente porque la gente identifica, probablemente de una manera muy elemental, identifica el Estado como el espacio de protección. Y la gente que tiene algo que temer, fundamentalmente los trabajadores o los, incluso los inmigrantes, eh, entienden que el espacio de protección único es el espacio nacional. Y Europa significa la desprotección, la apertura, el movimiento libre de capital, la desregulación, etc. Mientras, yo creo que mientras no consigamos invertir eh, 
los que pensamos en esto, los que escribimos, los que gestionan, los políticos, mientras nos consigamos que la gente entienda que, y que sea verdad esto, claro, que eh, asegurar la protección que proporcionaba el estado de bienestar ya solamente es posible a través de ciertas intervenciones a nivel europeo, mientras esto no sea plausible para la gente, el proyecto europeo no tendrá, no tendrá esa legitimación eh, popular, ¿no? Bien, hay, hay aquí un, una pregunta, un, dos preguntas que, con las que podíamos finalizar de, del Instituto Sanizaba Peña Florida, que tienen, Edgar, bastante que ver la pregunta número 5 y la número 6. Eh, ¿Puede una unión política traer consigo el peligro que supone la imposición de unos países sobre otros? y mmm, creo que íntimamente relacionada, o de alguna manera relacionada con esta, ¿puede la unión política traer consigo la pérdida de las culturas minoritarias? Dos preguntas que tienen que ver con la asimetría de poder y de hegemonía cultural posible o no en la, en la unión. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, both excellent questions. And the first one... Um, I addressed the first one uh, on uh, uh, the risks of a political union. Uh, I think the, um, it's exactly the other way around. Um, what's, what's the political reason, the political essence of a political union? Uh, from the very beginning, the European integration process was based on the assumption that there are imbalances of power among European countries. And these imbalances of power among European countries have become apparent in a horrible way uh, uh, in the first half of the 20th century. And so the point was, how can we contain uh, these powers and how can we make sure that these imbalances which are real, do no harm. What do I mean with these imbalances are real? The German economy is larger than the Belgian one. That's a fact. And uh, you, can't, uh, um, you can't change this. But this does not necessarily mean that the German economy, that Germany dominates Belgium. The fact that the military power of Germany in the first part of the 20th century was larger than most of its neighbor countries was a fact. And of course, uh, the, and we learned that all the efforts um, uh, to limit military power of, uh, of Germany in the first part of the 20th century um, it didn't work. So how can you contain German military power. Chamonet's brilliant idea was integrate them in a larger multilateral framework. Integration is the solution to the potential domination by one member state over the other. And of course, in this regard, the establishment of a high authority of supranational institutions, which are above the small and the large member states, is important. To have supranational law, which is binding for every member state, is important. The fact that consensus among the member states is indispensable. Europe is built on law, on law and consensus. This was our uh, uh, um, uh, uh, um, um, basic, uh, um, uh, basic finding. What happened in the Euro crisis? In the Euro crisis, the asymmetries among member states become once again effective. And they became effective because member states managed to 
get out of the control of supranational institutions and supranational law. The treaties, Germany and France, were the first ones that ignored the, uh, 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 the treaties uh, uh, in the Stability Pact in the, in the early 2000s. It was not the South European countries. And the South European countries learned very quickly that if the Germans can ignore the rules, they can do so as well. Um, uh, but if you allow a country like Germany to ignore the rules, what happens? Its economic power, its economic dominance becomes effective again. So if you don't contain these economic and political powers in a political union, you become the object and the victim of a German Europe, of German economic dominance. That's uh, for me, pretty evident. And uh, so, um, a political union, the containment of these economic and political powers in a common supranational framework is the only way out of this dominance. And this dominance is disintegrating. It's not, it's, uh, um, Germany is not, in this regard, a benevolent hegemon. It's disintegrating. Austerity is disintegrating. It's not benevolence. It's pain. So a political union, a, a political union is the solution to the problem. It's not part of the problem. So that's the first. Uh, that's the first. Uh, um, uh, that's the answer to the first question. And um, as I as I um, as I can be briefly on, uh, brief on the second one because in a way I answered this already uh, um, um, before when I addressed the eighth question. Uh, that's the cosmopolitan approach to national identities. Um, in uh, um, I think. The consequences of European integration for national and regional identities of minorities, of all kinds of minorities, very much depends on the integration approach, whether integration tolerates difference or not. If integration tolerates difference, if integration allows being different without fear, as I quoted Adorno before, then European integration, um, the European integration uh, will have a huge potential of political support and legitimacy. If it destroys these differences, if it is perceived as being a threat to minority rights, a threat to ethnical regional differences, then of course it loses its legitimacy, and rightly so. So there is an alternative. There are different visions of Europe. There are different ways out of the crisis. And it's up to the European citizens and to the European elites which way they go. One way is sustainable, that's the cosmopolitan one. I'm convinced that, it's the co that there is a cosmopolitan way out of this crisis. The other way is not sustainable, but this is the one um, um, suggested uh, by uh, political elites uh, right now. But in the end, it's the European the citizens. It's the European the citizens who decide. Okay. Hemos resistido toda la tarde hablando de Europa sin casi decir nada crítico sobre Alemania, pues porque nuestro invitado es alemán, pero como yo soy un poco impertinente me permito añadir una cosa, que es yo creo que en este contexto Alemania está jugando a ser un poder hegemónico y no un líder, no está ejerciendo liderazgo y creo que son dos cosas distintas. 
eh, la hegemonía es aprovechar para, en el propio beneficio una situación de asimetría sin ninguna preocupación por el conjunto. Mientras que el liderazgo exige, y Alemania lo podría ejercer en estos momentos, el liderazgo exige una mayor transferencia de soberanía y una cierta preocupación por el, por el conjunto. Y yo creo que esto es la situación en la que nos encontramos, una, Europa, una Alemania hegemónica y no una Europa que ejerza liderazgo, el liderazgo que le corresponde, por cierto, a su tamaño político y económico. ¿no? Eh, bueno, si, si Jacques Delors decía aquella frase tantas veces citada de que Europa era un ovni, un objeto político no identificado, esto significa que Europa es algo que tiene que ser pensado probablemente con un nuevo marco conceptual, que tiene que ser discutido de otra manera, para lo que probablemente tengamos que introducir una alta dosis de, de innovación eh, política y para el que probablemente necesitamos también eso que hoy en día se, de lo que hoy en día se habla tanto, que es una nueva narrativa, es decir, una nueva manera de contar, de explicar. Eh, alguien de vosotros preguntaba esto, ¿cómo se explica en las escuelas? Pues, ¿Cómo se explica Europa? ¿Cómo se hace a, a, a la gente eh, patente la nueva definición de lo común y de lo específico, de lo propio, de lo colectivo, de la minoría, la mayoría, etcétera? Bueno, todo este, este será precisamente el tema que nos va a ocupar en la, en la siguiente sesión, que será el próximo 18 de, de este mes, a la que estáis todos invitados, y en la, a la que vendrá eh, José Manuel Durado Barroso, eh, expresidente de la, de la Comisión Europea, y también Miguel Maduro, eh, viceprimer ministro de, de Portugal, y que lo celebraremos en la, en la antigua iglesia del Museo, si los organizadores y si los... Aquí las que mandan en el museo no me, no me contradicen y no me han dicho mal. Y a lo que, bueno, quedáis todos invitados y es que recasco.